um, environment built primarily on the Flash player. So it's the Flash player plus uh, things like local file system access. And because of that, it has sort of an install experience like any other application. It's not something you just download that can access your hard drive. Swift is basically the Flash file format and a content type that the Air runtime can handle. SWIC, again, is just basically a Flash or an Air library format. ActionScript is the language that you um, author intelligence with in Air applications or Flash applications. And it's very similar to JavaScript, but it has optional strong typing. And it, it has classes, and it does not have eval. And it is, in fact, compiled ahead of time to a bytecode. So when you download a Swift, you're not getting ActionScript source. You're getting a bytecode. And you know, obviously, that allows us to keep the flash runtime at the 1.5 megs it is today. Um, and a couple of, I'm probably going to mix and match what I refer to the uh, flash VM as. So it's known interchangeably, more or less, as AVM2, AVM Plus, or Tamarin Central, depending on what era your brain is in at the moment. And AVM is short for the Action Script Virtual Machine. And it's actually an interpreter and a very lightweight, very fast. Uh, JIT compiler. And ASC is, is the action script compiler, so that's what takes action script source and will generate this bytecode that can then be embedded in, in Swift. So, you know, usually I have a slide showing how much C and C code there is in open source compared to other languages and so forth, but I don't think I need to explain the motivation of reusing C code to this audience. So, there's lots of C code, it does lots of cool stuff. Wouldn't it be cool if you could use it? in Flash applications and in Air applications cross-platform. So a very brief history of, of the project. There are actually sort of three incarnations. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the last one, but just for a little bit of background. I started out with the MSIL writer-based uh, backend for LLVM and, and, strangely enough, wrote a variant of it that emitted C code uh, just to sort of prove out the concept, which I could then still just link to you know, the regular regular system libraries and so forth. And once I got uh, Doom working with that, I moved on to the second prototype, which was, again, based on the MSIL writer, but generated action script. Um, and that, obviously, could not link against the standard system library. So I sort of hand wrote very uh, iffy versions of fopen and fclose and you know, various graphic-y things for, again, Doom. And so the current iteration is fairly solid, and it's based on kind of a real code generation engine that was derived from the real Spark backend. So it does all the sort of real optimization passes, all the real instruction selection, all of that. And the C standard library is actually ported today from uh, basically the B BSD C standard library. I think I've got a, another slide on that. Um, the very low level system services obviously are, are handwritten in ActionScript. And so the implementation itself is basically just mArch equals AVM2. And you know, it, it, this is kind of a, the core of the whole technology. And because LLVM is so well designed and architected, it actually wasn't all that much work. It's something like 3,700 lines of C++, some of which still you know, may bear resemblance to the, the Spark backend, and you know, around 1,000 lines of, of TD. And the, the action script virtual machine is actually stack based. It's fairly similar to, to Java bytecodes in that way. And you know, that's a little bit in contrast with the way a typical code generation backend works. I mean, you've got your register descriptions and sort of all that stuff. So I kind of decided to just make up my own machine model, which is sort of loosely based on, on subset of, of the x86. So in my environment, there are effectively global variables that are named things like EBP, ESP, EAX, EBX, et cetera. And then there are also sort of, again, made up, uh, made up registers, 32 general purpose integer registers, 32 general purpose float registers. And I actually do parameter passing more or less in the x86 calling convention on a virtual stack using these virtual registers, which Kind of sounds funny, but um, it actually gives us a little bit of a speed boost over passing parameters the typical action script way because there's no boxing and unboxing overhead. 
And there is a concept of, of sort of RAM, which is just a monolithic chunk of bytes. And in ActionScript, in the Flash player, there's an object called a byte array, which is basically exactly that, only you can you know, usually have lots of them and do various things with them. And accessing that RAM is actually fairly fast with some optimizations that, that I've added that are um, actually shipping in, in Air 1.1 as we speak. And I'll talk a little bit more about the details there. So this is action script you might see as generated from the back end. And kind of doesn't really look like anything familiar. It doesn't, looks kind of maybe like some sort of very wordy assembly language. Maybe if you're really good at action script, you can see bits of it in there. But uh, my colleague, Dick Sweet, actually augmented the action script compiler to take what is effectively an action script inline assembler. So you can just sort of throw in there uh, raw AVM2 bytecodes. And that's useful for doing things like arbitrary branching, which ActionScript is not supported, does not have an arbitrary go-to. Uh, it also makes you know, various things faster. You can do very fast uh, switch statements, for example, this way, and, and a couple of other things. So this is kind of the overall build environment. <coughs> um, and this is sort of the the core here where I've done most of the work is, is really this back end to LLC. And that again generates action script, which you then just pass to the action script compiler with, with Dick's changes. And you'll generate a Swift at this point. And what's kind of interesting about, about, um, about the Swifts that are generated is that they've got a little bit of extra code that sort of knows about file pointers and you know standard IO and so forth. And when run sort of as a quote unquote shell script with the shell being this little um, C shim that I wrote, it actually brings up the Swift and makes a socket connection to that Swift and bridges basic file IO over that to the local system. So effectively what that means is you can take C code, run it through this chunk of tooling and just execute it on the command line and do sort of basic standard IO stuff, basic file access. And what this gives you is you can actually totally within this environment do dot slash configure because I've written several hacky, disgusting Perl scripts to go and run all the LLVM stuff, run the action script compilation, and sort of do this wrapping and so forth. So you can actually, with a fair number of packages that you just find in open source, download it, dot slash configure, and make, and it will actually all work, which is kind of convenient not having to bang out a, uh, a make file every time you want to build some some project you haven't built before. And this was fairly simplistic too. I mean, just a couple thousand lines of Perl and some C code to do the actual. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the interesting things about the Flash player is that it's sort of more like the browser in that it's, it's kind of event driven, whereas your typical C application is You've got your one main function, it runs forever. Uh, again, the more sort of event-based case on the right, you respond to a mouse click and do a little bit of work and, and kind of return back up. So if you kind of naively converted a C application to a Flash application, you'd have main, it would run for 15 seconds, hit flashes, the script has been running too long, timeout, and you would never see anything. So we have uh, basically a pass that takes synchronous C methods. So here's a very simple example of a, a synchronous C method. And turns it into an action script class that is more or less a, a, a finite state machine that can be sort of fed cycles and will iterate a state each time. So you can effectively interrupt your C program at a more or less arbitrary time. And that allows you to run a long running application without hitting the 15 second timeout. It also lets you do things like respond to keyboard events, which aren't going to get processed in Flash's event loop unless you sort of return all the way back up. So you can do things like you have your finite state machine and you hook it up to like a timer that's running a thousand times a second and it just sort of iterates on the finite state machine every time it, it, it gets hit. And so again, uh, basically each function is a finite state machine that roughly is equivalent to a, a, an action script class with like a state the state member variable in it and a big switch statement. Um, and the sort of local registers, I, I told you there were the sort of 32 general purpose integer and float registers. Those are actually local to each 
finite state machine. So I don't know, conceptually, it's like register windows or, or something along those lines. And so invoking a function is more or less equivalent to instantiating one of these finite state machine objects in, in this world. Um, and there are cases where we can establish that we definitely aren't going to need to sort of be able to suspend and resume this particular function. And in that case, we won't go to all the work to do the, the finite state machine as it has a reasonable amount of overhead. And so, you know, finite state machine uh, instances of function invocations are, are more or less uh, conceptually equivalent to two call frames, so there's sort of a chain of those at any given time. And again, typically, in a large, a large C application, those will be given time slices off of a timer object to give the, the flash run time, um, the ability to respond to events, and so forth. But a kind of neat side effect of this is you can just have multiple chains of finite state machines and just kind of you know, round robin between them and sort of simulate threads that way, despite the fact the flash virtual you can write multi-threaded C code on the Flash player, but not multi-threaded actions. Uh, so again, the, the C standard library itself is ported, but the basic system services like very low level open, not F open, but open, um, very low level memory management, not malloc, but S break, those things are um, written in primarily action script with a little bit of C glue code, and again, the bulk of the C standard library is ported. So you're probably wondering about performance. Um, and it's, it's surprisingly good. So this is Visual Studio 2008 optimized version of the Cymark 2 C version of their, their benchmark. And this is a log scale, just to be clear. And here's Flash Player X uh, running, running the same, um, the same benchmarks. And you know some of them are, are quite good. This is better than 50% of fully optimized native code, which is pretty good. And I think the worst case is still, I mean, yeah, it's pretty far off, but I mean, we're running C code in the flash player. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little bit broader, broader view here. So this is Simar 2 again, converted to action script fairly naively. Basically, it's syntactic translation, and it's running it on the machine I used at about 12 megaflops. Um, the flackified C version is running at about 304. The C sharp version, which was again basically syntactically translated from the Java variant of, of Cymark 2, is actually only slightly faster than the C version, which is kind of interesting. And the C version running on CLR is again only kind of incrementally faster. And once we get to um, Java, it's, you know, twice as fast, or about, and then maybe about twice as fast again here going to real native. And I've got a, a little performance demo too. The bar charts are nice, but run a little cheater up here to run as a sound. Even. So this is an air application. And this is basically the uh, Quake video game running on We all remember having to do this with, with Quake, turn the brightness up. Hopefully we can see that a little better, I don't know. Okay, so this is the, the Quake runtime, the, the, the Quake video game, um, ported using the tooling and running on uh, basically shipping Air 1.1, which is uh, more or less the more or less the uh, Flash 9 runtime with the memory optimizations that I sort of touched on earlier. And you know, it's running, I don't know, 30-ish frames per second or, or something along those lines. Obviously totally playable, 800 by 600. And this is the pure C code, so this isn't even using the nifty uh, assembly stuff the ID guys did originally. And it's all, it, you know, it's all these finite state machines for the asynchronicity too. So it's got kind of a lot working against it, and yet the, the performance is still pretty good. So coming to a browser near you. Is it on your blog site? No, I, there might be some licensing issues with trying to give away <laughs> Quake, although it would be cool. <clears throat> so the fast memory operations that, that I alluded to, 
essentially let you take that byte array, and again, we're using a monolithic single byte array as RAM, and kind of bless it as a, I'm the most important byte array in the room. And w once you've done that with single opcodes, you can load and store to and from that byte array. And those, since there's only this one byte array that we know of ahead of time, we can actually JIT these accesses one-to-one <coughs> -one with, you know, the sort of read opcode and an actual, like, move instruction on x86. So it's very, very fast. Obviously, it has to do range checking to make sure you don't, you know, escape the security sandbox. But in, in sort of real code, you see a lot of access EBP plus this, and then plus this, and then plus that, you know, uh, looking at arguments and doing spills and all sorts of stuff. And you can actually uh, basically range check whole series of those. So it's not even a range check per access. And it's actually it's actually quite fast. It's only a couple of percent, two or three percent, something like that overhead over um, just plain native memory accesses. And there's some other kind of random ones that sign extension opcodes. And strangely enough, uh, you can actually debug these C programs to a limited degree. Um, you know, LLVM will generate dwarf debug information for you, so I can just dump that into the SWIFT as, as binary data. Um, I can dump some of the other, you know, sort of higher level information as arrays and maps and so forth in, in the, the action script itself. Um, and basically I have a little tiny implementation of GDB's machine <laughs> protocol in the SWIFT actually burned in. And again, since these are, are chains of finite state machines, you can just hang that off somewhere and go off and talk on the socket to Eclipse or whatever or, or Xcode and then just sort of resume it when someone hits play again. So I should have prepared a demo for that, sorry. If anyone, I'll try and get it working at, uh, after the, the talk if anyone wants to see it. And so for actually doing kind of just chunks of C code that interface with ActionScript, it's, you know, with an application you can just sort of build it and run it. So you need kind of a glue layer if you want your ActionScript code to be able to talk to C code as like a library. So in, in a sort of matrix-esque way, there's this C API that looks suspiciously like you're a C program embedding uh, an interpreter uh, of some sort. Of course, it's actually the opposite. But, you know, from the C point of view, you have, you know, uh, handles on action script values and they're ref counted and, you know, you create strings and sort of all that nifty stuff. And here's kind of a very simple use of it. We just have like a main that just, you know, does some random stuff. This, this acquires the date class and, you know, constructs it with empty parameters and feeds it to trace so you'd see the date pop out in your debug log if you, if you ran this in the, um, the flash debugger. And you use this to sort of create an action script object that can interface with your C code effectively. So what we have here is we have um, kind of a, a a thunk that ActionScript knows how to call here. It's a, it's a C function, but it returns one of these ActionScript handles, takes in a handle to an ActionScript array for the parameter list and, and so forth. And in your main, you basically just construct an object with main value pairs, typically functions. So some entry here is going to be a, a property of an ActionScript object created by this call that is actually going to contain a, a thunk to this. And pass that object to the I'm done initializing my library call. And so from the action script side, hopefully this is somewhat readable, you can just sort of create the object representing the library as a whole, initialize it, and this returns the value that we pass to as3lib in it. So basically you get um, an action script object out that again has functions on it that you can just call from action script land and that sort of does all the all of the basic marshalling and so forth. And at, at some point, it had occurred to me that there's a whole class of C and C++ programs that were especially interesting, and that is interpreters. Uh, for example, the Python interpreter is all C, Lua interpreter is all C, Ruby interpreter, all C. And so why not take a code base like that and make it into a library callable from ActionScript? And it turns out that, you know, you can basically just take Python dot slash configure make. Uh, and you can take 
that, that header file for the, the sort of glue layer, the C manipulating action script objects layer, and run it through something called SWIG, which is a, a basically a glue code generator that can take C header files, parse them, and generate glue code for a large number of languages, various flavors of PHP, Lua, et cetera, et cetera. Link that all in and get basically a Gigantor flash SWIC out that is the Python interpreter with the ability to communicate with the action script environment. And so once you have that, you know, you can write some nifty little wrapper Python here. All this stuff really does is uh, uh, sort of masquerading as action script objects. So, you know, when you do a get adder, when you try to get the attribute of one of these things that calls in through all those crazy action script functions saying, do you have this attribute? Yes, what type is it? Let's marshal it over which lets you basically write Python code. So this is fairly simple Python code, but you see it's just basically calling straight into the Flash API here. So flash.display.sprite, and it's sort of creating a, a circle, effectively, and adding some event listeners here. And it's just, you know, it's just passing Python closures right in as event handlers to action script, and that's all marshaled totally, totally transparently. And while well, you'll have to use your imagination, uh, and imagine a, a little bit better demo. I do have, I do have that Python running in the Flash player. So every Python code created all these circles. Every time I click them, it's Python responding to the events. Every you know, every time it updates, there's Python code running. I've got one more. Let's see. So this is the Lua interpreter, and this one I've just decided to leave uh, interactive. So I can do, for example, print six or whatever, and we'll ignore the, the debug output for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem with booting, booting Linux, I would love to get there. So have I booted <laughs> Linux yet? So the big problem with booting Linux, and, and yes, that question has been asked a couple of times is, this system is effectively a Harvard archi architecture, which isn't totally compatible with the, uh, the Linux kernel design. There's no sort of, you know, real reason you couldn't boot something up that was boot up more or less anything that was kind of Harvard architecture. So this is some Lua code, and again, you know, it, it's fairly similar to the the Python you saw. It's just happily going off and, and creating flash shapes and so forth, and I can. Uh, just paste that code in there and we create a nice little sign and I can throw a little more code in there and make it follow the mouse just for fun. And what is a little bit interesting about this is the, um, the loop following the mouse is just a while one. And again, because of the asynchronicity, I can just do a yield here, right in the middle of my, my infinite loop. And let's see, I guess that's about all of my slides. I did have one more um, demo. The, the stack here is kind of huge. I probably should have had a, a slide on it, but it's a little too disgusting to actually commit to paper. But you know, you have, like in the Lua case, you've got Lua code running on top of a C-based Lua interpreter that, you know, if you want to be pedantic, went to LLVM IR and then went to ActionScript and then went to ActionScript bytecode, which is then, you know, converted to, believe it or not, another IR in the Flash player before it's jitted to x86 code and then run as, as x86. Um, but I decided to do something uh, slightly more disgusting, actually. So this is a C-based Nintendo emulator that is emulating a 6502 and some other random chips. <laughs> Translated to ActionScript 3 running on the Flash player. I think that's about all I have, so. I can even remember how to play that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Any questions? <laughs> Was that a question? Do I need to repeat that? <laughs> Any questions? So I don't entirely understand the need to increase the, the while loop and the asynchronicity. Um, it doesn't seem like a different situation about just how fast that. I mean, if you call a team that never returns, then yeah, it's not handling that before. Um, that's, that's sort of not generally true at like the high level, like a Windows application. Typically does have effectively a while loop that in that while loop is getting events. Right. And actually, well, at some level, somebody called main and main is blocking. Right. Whereas in the Flash player, if you call main and main blocks, Literally no events go into any queues, no drawing happens. Whereas with something like Windows or X Windows or OS X or whatever, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There are other processes, feeding queues, or you know, various things depending on the implementation. So, like in a Cocoa app, for example, it's exactly the same thing. You have to, your main has to call Cocoa's main, which just turns on and calls you sometimes. And it's supposed to be exactly the same thing as in Flash. Uh, and if you block in one of those callbacks, well, yeah, I, I guess it sort of depends on, on what you think is inside and what you think is outside, and I have a little bit of a skewed perspective on that maybe, but there's sort of, there's no way from ActionScript to call into Flash and say, do your event processing. Flash calls you, there's no way to do the reverse. Okay, maybe I don't understand the way Cocoa works well enough. Right. I may not understand the way Cocoa apps work under the hood too much. Maybe we can talk about it okay. offline. Have you thought about getting performance by increasing the resolution of the number of instructions that you execute in your asynchronous station? So, like, you have an add and an add. And uh -huh. adding yeah, that like was sort of a. So, the, the The question is about the granularity of, of um, the amount of work done on each sort of quote unquote finite state machine iteration. And actually, the example is, was really contrived. It actually does a, typically a fairly large amount of work per state. And in fact, a lot of times there are loops or maybe even doubly nested loops that live entirely within one state. If you, can, if you know that it's, it's not going to take 15 seconds to, to terminate. Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, a lot of people are excited about being able to write Flash applications in Python. Um, a lot of people are excited about being able to reuse open source libraries. One of the examples I, I, I tend to give is like libxml and, and libxslt. ActionScript has built in like e, you know basic E4x capabilities, but to do real kind of transforms and, and real heavy duty validation and all that kind of stuff. You're either just going to not do that in your action script. You're going to write a 10,000, 100,000 million lines of action script to deal with it, or with this technology, you can just take libxslt. Well, it wouldn't be caught. I mean, it wouldn't escape the sandbox because it can't. It, sorry, the, if there's a security flaw in the original C code, how does that manifest in, in this environment? And the flaw does not go away. And the flaw is not caught, per se, either. But since um, it's restricted to that one byte array, it can't actually corrupt the flash player or you know, steal data anywhere or anything like that. The worst it can do is crash. And yes, the, you know, double freeze happily port in this system and will happily, will happily cause your C environment in flash to come down. It's just not going to take the real application with it. So I do have function pointers, and they are array uh, array indexes, indexes into a big array of action script functions. Ah, okay. So, okay, so you could still you could still change the 
So keep in mind, I have the only thing that I've done to modify the, the Flash environment is I've added the ability to very quickly access a single byte array. So I, you know, unless I screwed that part up, I've kind of de facto not introduced any security, I, any security issues that weren't already there. Right. Which you could do with ActionScript or with JavaScript if it was badly written. I mean, at that point, okay. you know, you're right. You can still cause yeah, the yeah. program to behave badly, and depending on whether you've allowed it, web service accesses to some server, something bad can happen, but it's not unique to this system. So, did you run any limitations for scalability as you're generating significantly larger apps in some cases than it was the core core designed to handle? Not really. The it's the so the question is, did I run into any scalability issues with the Flash player? And the answer is not really. Um, it's got quite a neat little JIT. I mean, it doesn't do a lot of optimizations. It's not. It's certainly not as heavy duty as the kind of thing you would get out of LLVM. But that also makes it small and fast and not consume a lot of memory. So the only way that I, I did get the Flash player to become unhappy is I sort of naively embedded a ridiculous, ridiculously deep data structure to represent some debugging information in, in one of my examples. And that, in fact, did cause it to decide that there was too much bytecode and, and give up. But in general, I mean, follow sure? All right, so the follow-up question is, <laughs> so the question is. You just told me there's no limitations. So the question is, could we bootstrap the uh, LLVM environment in in Flash? And strangely enough, I've been asked that question before too. <laughs> Do you have an answer? Um, I I don't see any particular reason why that wouldn't work. So it's just beyond your limit of insanity. Well, it's beyond how insane I've been so far, but <laughs> one of the one of the the big scalability issue I did run into in trying to get um, PHP to run, I do have PHP running as well, is that it has so much built into it that the compiler, the ActionScript compiler, choked on the vast amount of ActionScript I was handling it. But the the player itself, it's very robust. It's a pretty nice piece of software. Um, not in Slack. Well, yes, actually. Uh, there is a mode where you don't use those new, neat, fast uh, memory opcodes. And in fact, you can target the, fl the shipping Flash 9 player that way. The performance is not nearly as good. It's in a lot of cases an order of magnitude or so worse than you saw here. You can play Quake, but only 320 by 200. How big is the byte array? The byte array? It's as big as you need it to be. It can grow. I mean, at some point, you'll run out of the Flash player will refuse to, to grow it for you. 32 bit. The VM is 32 bits. So, I have been asked that as well. <laughs> and not entirely in jest. The Flash player, obviously, obviously, where the, the question, did I repeat the question already? No, but you can't. Make. The question was, could you compile the Flash player and run it in the Flash player? <laughs> and uh, the virtual machine and the, the bytecode in Flash player 9 is actually new, and there was an older variant of that. So there are actually two interpreters and JITs for two whole different bytecodes, essentially, in the Flash player. And there's been some interest in taking the old flavor, which is only used for old Swifts, and compile that using this technology and sort of download it on demand. So 